starting with Victor, which, by the way, is his birthday today. So. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm Victor Giraldo. I'm a technical director for carbon and biodiversity projects in Trafigura. I've been working in the carbon market for the past 18 years and looking beyond carbon for the past eight, 10 years, uh, looking to increase the quality of carbon projects connecting them with broader payment for ecosystem services schemes in some countries, biodiversity offsets, and also biodiversity crediting. So that has been a challenge that we are, that have been facing and now uh, in Trafigura looking to integrate climate change and biodiversity loss component in our projects. Hello, my name is uh, Stephanie Kaiser. Please apologies for my voice. I lost it this morning. Um, I'm the sector head for um, nature-based solutions, carbon markets, and forestry at Nature Metrics. For those of you who don't know Nature Metrics, we are a nature insights provider. So basically, people come to us, people like yourselves who have forestry assets or other projects, land-based projects, and we can detect an and monitor animal species and soil biodiversities and produce scalable long-term data from your projects. And we use this by um, analyzing water and soil samples and detecting the environmental DNA of the organisms that are present on your space. So my um, background is in um, biology, impact investing and forestry, both carbon forestry and productive forestry. And during my time at Nature Metrics, I've been talking to a lot of different stakeholders in that sector that is investing in restoration and conservation, and in particular focusing on project developers and sponsors in the forestry sector. Good morning all. My name is uh, Tapani Pakkasla. I'm a partner at Dassos Capital. We're based in Finland. Um, we are an asset manager in forestry. We manage forest assets for our clients, mainly institutional clients. Uh, mention the numbers, uh, 1.5 billion euros, 265,000 hectares across seven different funds in our portfolio. I, we, I have spent my last uh, few years uh, thinking in, on biodiversity, how to make that investable on scale, and I think we have cracked the equation slowly, and, and we are also running one of the, I think one of the few or only ones uh, in, uh, impact investment funds in Europe that is investing in, into biodiversity, so I'll be discussing that a little bit today. Hey everyone, good morning. I'm Chrissy Durkin. I'm the VP of Growth and Impact at Rainforest Connection in Arbimon, and we're kind of the acoustic counterpart to the eDNA. So we work on scalable biodiversity monitoring, primarily using sound, combining that with satellite information and other biodiversity metrics um, and data. Uh, we have been working in the field for about 10 years, developing hardware, software, an AI-enabled platform to be able to do biodiversity monitoring and threat detection at scale um, using sound. So I'm excited to be here with you all today. Thank you very much. And I was wondering, uh, Victor, perhaps you could uh, talk us a little bit more about why measuring biodiversity returns is important for Trafigura, particularly from the demand side. Um. We've been working for the past three years building bankable, large-scale landscape approaches worldwide. But what means landscape approaches for us means the integration of productive systems with restoration, forest conservation, and degraded ecosystem enhancements. But how can we measure that? How can we identify what is our real impact? As a forestry engineer, I truly respect different forestry practices so we believe that integrated commercial plantations with native species restoration and forest conservation it's a, with communities, it's a truly landscape approach definition that we are managing. And in some cases, monitoring flora and fauna is quite easy and very charismatic for a forest. But what happens when you have a degraded baseline, almost zero soil? How can you measure and start to evaluate how a plantation in a zero soil or highly degraded area is impacting biodiversity? 
then we recognize the importance to check what is going on in soils, for example, how soils can be recovered, and how can we integrate, for example, the recovery of these soils with restoration purposes. How can we promote through restoration with non-native species, then the incorporation of native species as a restoration bridges strategy. So in our landscape, landscapes, in our pro the projects that we are developing for uh, different uh, level of demands, we are looking to monitor all these impacts through different baseline elements. That's why it's so important to recognize that when you have a forest, it's quite charismatic, the forest inventory, fauna and flora. But when you have degraded ecosystem where you are intended to create environmental additionality, how can we suggest measure the real impacts on biodiversity at different stages? That's why it's so important for Trafigura in our bankable and large scale landscape approaches. Just keep this. For us, we manage landscapes. We integrate all these elements and monitoring the way that biodiversity can be impacted through different strategies from commercial to pure restoration or degraded ecosystems uh, uh, enhancements, biodiversity enhancements, it's clear for our, uh, to, 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 for our projects. And also to communicate to our clients. Real impact measurements, not just using biodiversity as a very nice descriptive co-benefit to engage it's a way, it's something that has to be measured and managed through time. That's why it's so important for us. Thank you, Victor. I think, yes, really important to acknowledge this landscape view, but also the need to be like really pragmatic uh, in terms of the project that we are tackling. Thank you for that. Tapani, I was wondering if you could expand a little bit on this question as well, on why for Dasos Capital this is relevant. And this as well links with one of the conversations we were having yesterday about for the financial sector, it's very important to value nature. So I was wondering if you could also expand on that. Thanks, Anne. And I'll pick up where Victor left, sort of measuring <laughs> biodiversity there. I think it's Im important to, to separate two things. One is, uh, well, I hear a lot of people talk about na natural capital investments, and they then usually talk about carbon, and they mention biodiversity sort of on top of that. And I think it's important to separate what is biodiversity, what is carbon. And you can't really measure biodiversity <coughs> through uh, measuring carbon. That's completely different. Uh, in my view, um, carbon is global, so it's a global phenomenon. We saw yesterday the, the, all the numbers and graphics. It is a real problem. Uh, so is the lack of uh, biodiversity or, lo or loss of nature, loss of biodiversity. So I think it's important to say that biodiversity is a local problem, and the solutions have, have to be local. People in South England, they don't really care about what happens in my village, or people in my village, they're not really concerned about South England, at, at least not that much. And if we were comparing the Congo Basin or Amazon, they're different and the solutions have to be different. So I, th I think it's important to take uh, into consideration that the solutions for biodiversity have to be local and the carbon solutions are more global. Um, another thing that was mentioned yesterday is the mitigation hierarchy. Of course, we all, all would like to avoid uh, the loss of nature in, in projects, but it's unfortunately not going to happen if it doesn't have a price. So I think that's why it's important to put a price on nature. And to put a price on nature, you have to be able to take the nature out of the equation or sort of biodiversity out of the equation. Uh, look at the biodiversity apart, put a price on it and put it back, back there. Uh, how you do that, it's, it's more complicated, of course, but th that's the only way I see this mitigation hierarchy will work if nature has a price, so offsetting and compensation projects. There you put a price on nature and put that into the investment equation, and there's a cost of harming the nature. So That's why it's important to look at biodiversity separately from carbon, not to put that bundle those together. We know that what is good for a Carbon is not necessarily good for biodiversity, but we know that what is good for biodiversity is probably good for carbon. And carbon can be, how I see this right now, is carbon is a sort of a co-benefit of biodiversity projects. Thank you very much. And entering a little bit more on the existing uh, metrics and what different data providers are developing, I was wondering if Stephanie and Chrissy could expand a little bit more on how existing metrics respond to this mean 
it means in what extent they do, and also what are the principles that these metrics should have in order to be robust. Okay, um, I'm trying to simplify it a bit and then I'll let you um, deep dive into the details. First of all, I'm extremely excited to be here. I come from a banking family, but then went to work more in biology and in forestry. And now I see that we have on the one side, the investment side, uh, the corporate side, they really want to kind of make nature investable, which is amazing. And then we've got nature, which is messy, it's big, it's complex. And at Nature Metrics, we're like in this middle point where we want to turn or return nature into data. And I know a lot of you, I've seen a lot of you at conferences where a lot of the project developers and sponsors are stuck and they freeze in confusion because they're like, how are we going to squeeze nature into metrics that we can put in our Excel spreadsheet? Because when it's in a spreadsheet, then it matters, right? I guess. So. I was uh, on the train here looking at the principles of the new VERA nature crediting framework and it really resonated with me because in my simple mind I would say if we want to scale up uh, investment in nature, uh, the metrics and the data we use need to tick sort of three big boxes. One is, and this is the same as in traditional ecology, is that we want to have metrics and indicators that are ecologically meaningful so that they actually represent something meaningful on the ground because otherwise we're going to go back into the greenwashing space which a lot of you would not want right so we do need to work with ecologists people who know what they're doing and that also means sometimes you know um, we need to have that flexibility between higher level standardization and localized, okay? So biodiversity is complex, we need the ecologists. Um, secondly, <coughs> obviously we need data that are defendable, scientifically robust, and ideally also using methods that are standardized because we're talking here about feeding these metrics and data into markets. So we cannot make mistakes and have ad hoc measurements or patchy data sets and everyone, someone does something here and someone else does something there, we can't compare it, right? That's not how markets work. At the same time, we also need metrics that can be produced in a way that's feasible, operationally feasible, financially feasible. I know some of you have talked to and they say, oh, we want all of this, but um, we don't want to really pay for it because it's a new cost. And then you're like, well, you can't have everything. We need to find the balance between that. And so when we create metrics and producer data, there are trade-offs. And um, I think what Vera said, it's about balancing out um, comparability, having a layer of metrics that can be compared across ecosystems, across um, countries. And then we'll have a layer of ecosystem-specific metrics or where projects can choose their own metrics to make it relevant, okay? then we also need to choose between rigor and accessibility. And so I invite you also to speak to the people of Plan Vivo, of Vera, and see how they balance that out. And then if you speak to your MRV providers, most of them, Nature Metrics, Rainforest Connection, we will align our metrics with these frameworks. Um, so work with us, ask us, but don't get too confused, it is doable. That was beautifully said, and I agree with all of those points. Um, Especially that, yeah, nature is messy, um, but scientists have been on a project-specific level doing an excellent job at understanding what change looks like over time. The big question is, how do you make that scalable and how do you make that comparable? Um, and the good news is that we're in a really good place with technology right now to be able to tackle that. So these approaches that have been, ha I mean, so I work in bioacoustics. It's nothing new. People have, it's a century old. People have been recording sounds of ecosystems and listening to them to try to understand what's happening. Um, the big challenge is around how do you make that happen in a way that can be global, fast, accessible, cost effective. Um, and now that we have these cloud-based infrastructures, artificial intelligence, it's really possible. So. What we've been focused on, to use you know, sound as an example, sound is incredible. Most animals make noise, right? Especially a lot of indicator species of ecosystem health. So birds, frogs, bats, mammals, insects, we're talking right now, right? If there was a sensor in here, you could tell that we were here. Um, so it's a pretty incredible way to understand what is happening within ecosystems, um, both from a presence perspective, but also from a behavior perspective. There's so much richness in sound. 
um, the challenges that it's messy. Um, and so what we've been focused on is building the infrastructure and capacity to store that data on a global scale. We currently have data from over 120 countries. Thousands of scientists are all collaborating to add data into this integrated platform. Um, we have made it free for scientists to store, manage, access, and analyze that data. And we're building algorithms and artificial intelligence models to do that really quickly and efficiently so that you can essentially, from biodiversity hotspots around the world, collect data, input it into the platform, and it'll automatically be able to generate species presence across all of your sampling sites. We can then combine that information with ecological um, climatic variables and get all sorts of advanced analyses quite quickly now. So like all of this is possible and accessible. Um, the question is really, how do we make it um, standardized that all of these data sets can talk to each other? All of these amazing organizations are starting to really take hold of this. We need to join forces and do this collaboratively um, and then start to be able to pull that together with additional biodiversity information. Like some species don't make noise. So that's where it makes a ton of sense for eDNA and acoustics to work together. So we're kind of at this place where it's absolutely possible to tackle these challenges. We have the technology to do so. Um, and I'm really excited to see how this space unfolds for us all to be able to work together, especially within these frameworks that are emerging, um, to be able to do that in a scalable yeah, and cost-effective way. Um, I think my biggest takeaway from today, if anything, is that um, we shouldn't run from trying to understand what's happening and measure it effectively because it's, it's really possible and it's happening already. Thank you so much, uh, Chrissy and Stephanie. And I also want to, to say that standardization, like mixing this with AI and all of this is, is great effort, but we also should acknowledge what is happening in the ground. And this morning I got to know that actually Stephanie is soon going on a trip around the UK to measure bioacoustics. So she is basically going to do a rowing trip. So it's important to uh, Chrissy. Uh, sorry, to acknowledge like all the work that goes as well behind uh, the collecting this data. So now to put it a little bit more into perspective and with some real examples on projects and what metrics that they put into place to do this, I wanted Victor uh, to provide us with an example of how you made this uh, happen in Trafigura, if you can link to potentially an example in Colombia. What metrics did you put in place? And what were the challenges that you encountered to do this in practice? Good. Um, just to, ref to take some of the elements of uh, my colleagues, uh, developing practicing exercises to value how much cost us to enhance biodiversity, it's always important. And now we have enough science to play with a basket approach, with a matrix approach, or different level of approaches to identify the best indicators we need according to the sp specific dynamics of the landscapes that we are managing. That's something that it's important. We don't, need to, we, we don't have to be afraid of trying to develop pricing exercises to identify how much it costs us to uh, enhance biodiversity. It is not a valuation per se, we all know in some cases, biodiversity is difficult to measure uh, its, its own value. But pricing exercises with the science that we have right now, artificial intelligence, eDNA, acoustics, it's good enough to move forward. Not to always say biodiversity is so complex that we cannot develop in any proxy pricing exercise because it's invaluable. No. Just let's try to change the mindset because we have enough science. In Trafigura, we are looking for different principles in, in our projects. That it's uh, uh, investment in, in the investment grade uh, topic, it's projects that can be bankable. That's very important for us. We look for transparency, visibility, and accessibility. This is, it, it, it means science accessible for all stakeholders, not only for scientific people. We need to talk in a global language biodiversity, biologists, we need to set the elements that allow us, that allow other stakeholders to participate in the conversation. For some, of, for some of us could be more scientific, other ones will be market mechanism languages, and other ones will be financial or social. 
elements of biodiversity. And then we look to report that elements to, to the rest of the people through DMRB system, digital monitoring reporting elements. The project in Colombia, it's a landscape approach. We are integrated, integrated non-native species afforestation projects in a highly degraded baseline. And we also want to incorporate native species. But what is the problem? The soils are so degraded that some trials trying to add native species massively, massively uh, are not good enough. So they can face the risk that, okay, everybody wants natives, everybody wants high biodiversity elements, but we need to understand soils first. In a landscape approach with highly degraded baseline, soils are one of the key questions that we needed to solve. Like, okay, how can we make a restoration bridge strategy incorporating native species to restore soils, and then when they are enough recover, start to incorporate native species. At the same time, developing trials with different native species that we can collect with the surrounded still natural ecosystem. That was our main challenge in Colombia. And then through the EADNA uh, metrics, we, start, we, we, we decided to start to understand what happened. With Nature Matrix, we developed uh, an initial testing phase for soil and water to understand what is going on, how a monocultures plantation can develop a structure, incorporate organic uh, matter in the soils, and allow that degraded soils can be, okay, can be in a, what is the level of, the, of, of recovery or the level of degradation at that point, and compare that for, with, for example, uh, other areas uh, more recovered with the plantations and natural forest. So our idea is uh, developing specific matrix or measurements to understand with the soils in all those systems. And then we can identify what is the middle point, when we can start to add the native species that at this stage that cannot grow. And we cannot afford to develop a large scale, massive mixed species, native species restoration projects, and then the next year they can all die because the soils are not good enough for them. So with Nature Matrix and the eDNA testing, we started that soil sampling process to understand the level of degradation of these specific baseline conditions under different scenarios, forests, restore lands, highly degraded lands, to see how can we manage through time different elements. Let's start with non-native species, let's go on to a certain point that the soils are recovered, and then let's start to incorporate a selection of native species from the region to connect those systems with the remaining natural forests. So that's uh, the, the, the solution that we are looking for, that is the testing process that we are developing, always thinking on a, as a landscape approach. How can we integrate productive systems with restoration and natural ecosystem at the same time. Thank you so much, Victor, for that. It's, it's really interesting, you know, to hear how it actually works in practice, and you start, you know, adding metrics and uh, including like the native species angle over time, and yeah, subsequently. So I understand in this project you work with nature metrics. You mentioned that. So I was wondering, Stephanie, if you could expand a little bit how the process works. Yeah, absolutely. First of all, I want to say that I really love working with Victor because he gets stuff done. There's a lot of people, as I said, a lot of people in the forestry sector who want to do or should do exactly what he does, which is basically looking at the different forest types, at the different silvicultural regimes, and understand how does that relate to what's happening below ground. Okay, So I have a list of maybe 50 companies that all want to do the same. It's a very, very clear case study for understanding soil biodiversity in agriculture and forestry. So in this case, what we were looking at is like a chrono sequence, you know, from degraded soils, eucalyptus plantation, then mixed, and see how does that relate to biodiversity. This is also what Victor's doing, going to be very meaningful for another approach, which is woodland creation, where you take your soil biodiversity baseline at the beginning, like ideally, parking lot nothing 
and then you uh, take local benchmarks in existing forests. And then you can actually, as you monitor your, the forest that is growing over time, you can then see and actually quantitatively track how the biodiversity in the soil is changing as you construct a meaningful forest. And um, we actually do have a, a pilot project um, with Vera, I hope, I hope I'm allowed to say this, sorry, um, that is looking exactly as that. So there's a lot of interest and in what you're doing is really pioneering. Now, <clears throat> how the process worked is, um, so Victor and the project implementer in Colombia, they approached me and I really liked the fact that it was both Victor from the demand side and the very lovely um, forest engineers, Alvaro. Um, I was then in contact with him on WhatsApp. He's really nice and he was talking to me about like how it is on the ground, like, you know, explaining me of the practical challenges. And we discussed like, how are we going to design that? Basically, is where are we going to take the soil samples? So that's where our survey design and the product design, the business development team come in and we help them decide like the, how many samples to take, where to take them and what it means. Okay. So we've now gone through this. <clears throat> we've then sent them um, standardized kits. So we have one for soils and one for water that we sent to Colombia and they've received them in El Vichada. So they have them and now it means anyone there with a simple video can take these soil samples, which means they don't need to have uh, expensive consultants. It also means that whoever takes the soil samples, if they follow the guidelines, you should get the same results. So that is you know, standardization, accessibility, uh, operational streamlining. So now the next step will be um, Alvaro, I think, is now in the field there. He will take the samples. Hopefully he follows all the guidelines. And then um, he will ring us <coughs> and say, guys, pick it up. So we will get it picked up in Colombia send it to our labs, and then in the lab we will extract um, the DNA, amplify it, sequence it, and compare it to databases to then give them results on, <coughs> in this case, the uh, fungal species in the soil and the inver soil invertebrates in the soil. So we have seen that the metric on, we have metrics on species composition, uh, functional diversity, and also we will do hopefully functional profiling, which is in the pipeline. We've seen that the issue of soil fungi seems to be a crucial topic in forestry because it can, you have obviously your ectomycorrhizal fungi, it can also have correlations to um, soil carbon permanence. So I think in the future, as we get more data on soil biodiversity, we can establish more and more correlations to how the land management actually affects um, soil biodiversity. And again, what we really like doing at Nature Metrics is, in an ideal world, the sponsors will often come to us, you know, and they have a certain understanding, certain needs. We want the field teams to come in and talk to us, ideally in the same call, so we create common understanding and never lose touch of what's happening on the ground. And yeah, so just to say that our actually our most common uh, product that most of you know is aquatic eDNA, which focuses on vertebrates. And that's why also we have a very nice connection to what you're doing, Chrissy. And I know that we have one project where we do uh, rainforest vertebrates from eDNA and then um, also bioacoustics by rainforest connection. Yep. In Madagascar. Yeah. Yes. So, Chrissy, it would be great to understand, you know, like how bi bioacoustics are <laughs> complementary to eDNA and how actually they become more powerful, these techniques, when combined. Totally. Um, and so uh, I think the first step that we've been working on is starting to combine the actual sampling methodologies, right? Because the first step is the data collection. So similar with the eDNA kits, we can combine that with deploying acoustic sensors in the field. So generally for our projects, we'll look at GIS layers and we'll figure out, you know, what is the sampling approach needed to answer the specific scientific questions, whether that's, you know, trying to identify a critically endangered species in the Galapagos, we look for the mangrove finch, there's only like 100 individuals left, or whether it's across restoration sites in which we want to compare different levels of restoration. Sampling designs differ a little bit depending on what the project approach is. But we can combine that with eDNA methodologies, also camera trap methodologies. I mean, there's this really cool opportunity to bring all of these technologies together. And we're starting to do that in quite a few projects. For example, the one in Madagascar um, with nature metrics. 
uh, the result of that is you're able to see, um, in addition to everything Stephanie just spoke about um, with fish species and all sorts of amazing things, you can also really capture all of the birds and mammals and amphibians and things that are more challenging to capture with eDNA and bring all of that together to have quite a comprehensive understanding. And then we can look really in depth at um, richness and composition and all the, these derived indicators that are needed for these different approaches. Um, some of the things I'm most excited about is starting to aggregate all of these data sets at a global scale. So, um, I mean, we have these biodiversity maps um, that are not super based on ground truth data, but we're starting to get to the point where we're able to actually have real information from sites around the world. And that's really exciting to me, especially because Stephanie also talked about baselines and being able to compare and see what does progress look like? What does good look like, right? Having information about baselines that already exist in different regions around the world, it if we have that already, if we have models built, if we're able to quickly analyze data, we can compare new data collection to these different um, existing information and have an even more robust understanding of, yeah, what good looks like, what progress looks like. Um, and we're, we're about to publish our first global report. Again, data from about 120 countries. Um, that's also exciting because we can use this information to start to guide investment, right? We can say, okay, using real data from the ground, these are the areas and combining that with satellite information, there's this kind of amazing picture we can paint that says, these are the highest value investment regions based on real data as well. So there's all of these kind of incredible opportunities. And then as Victor mentioned, how do you bridge the gap between that science and real conservation action on the ground, right? How do you translate those metrics, that real scientific information into things that corporations can, can use, but also local communities can use, right? There's all of these different stakeholders throughout this entire, I mean, throughout this entire process that need to make use of this data. So how do you translate that into meaningful and, and simple un understandings that can, can show progress and that can really inform how we're actually acting on the ground? So those are some of the things we've been thinking about and focused on. And um, it's super exciting to see how we can start to combine all of these different methodologies in, in quite incredible ways. Thank you, Chrissy. Um, it's, it's really interesting how all these methodologies are scaling. And I was wondering what are Tapani's thoughts? I know you also have experience developing these projects in the ground and, and how you see incorporating these uh, insights as they come through. My experience in, in making biodiversity investable is they need to simplify things quite a lot. We just heard a lot here, uh, all kinds of species and animals and, and fish and everything. And for people with limited bandwidth or, or just busy schedules, you have to simplify things a lot. And that's fine when there's science behind it. So that, that's my experience. You have to find a way to communicate in, in a clearer way. I have an example from land use sector where you I mean, measuring, for me, measuring biodiversity is very simple. It's uh, size times quality times impact. So if you have something that is of one hectare of size and it has a, some sort of quality and the impact is minus 100%, so you, what you have left at the end is nothing. And then you sort of measure your loss and you transfer it to another site, you have your gains. And if your gains are above your losses, then you're net positive, biodiversity positive. So that's, that's how people, ha in my experience, how people have understood it. We've been working with uh, people on the renewable sector. We heard yesterday how green energy is fantastic. It's not fantastic for the place where it's installed necessarily. If you build something on top of a forest land, I mean, you lose forest cover and you lose uh, nature. And I think the sort of traditional approach to sustainability has been to limit the harm. So we try to do as little harm as possible, but I think now going to the future, we have to create more nature and a lot of these projects, it's possible. We know we can measure it. Um, in my view, we have to simplify how we measure it, have sort of common, common currency that applies to all types of nature within the local geography, local nature, and then create more nature with the funds of that project. So now we have found a way to, to we have able to channel more funds into biodiversity, into building more nature. So that, in our experience, that has worked. Uh, Renewable energy developers, they want to be biodiversity positive. They want to sell 
energy that is not causing deforestation or biodiversity loss. It's fossil free, yes, but also has to be nature loss free, it has to be forest loss free. And, and that's one thing we're seeing in a big scale and a big opportunity there to price the biodiversity in into the electricity, have consumers buy uh, biodiversity positive energy. We know pe people are buying already sustainable forest products. There is a premium for that. In FSC certification, for example, there is a premium for biodiversity. That's another example. You can take the biodiversity out of the equation and put a price on it and then put it back there and it works. You can finance nature protection there. Protection or, let's say, restoration, both of those. So, in, in short, uh, simplify the message, see what, what is really the biodiversity there, put a price on it, and in, in my view it works. Thank you very much. So I understand we have like three minutes for questions and answers. So I wonder, yes, one there, please. Um, thank you very much. Uh, the question relates to ownership. So in the context of carbon, it's relatively straightforward because carbon is at a landscape level in forests, in soil. Now, in the context of where we work in Tanzania and we're starting to look at a biodiversity project, the first key question we're asking is who owns the biodiversity? And in the context of large mammals, most vertebrates, it's owned by central government, which means monetizing the asset becomes complicated in terms of flowing the revenue to communities. So I wondered if you could comment on the ownership of biodiversity in relation to asset creation. Very happy to have a first take on this. Uh, I'm absolutely disappointed with European governments, how they've socialized carbon. Uh, to me, whatever grows on the fund investors' land belongs to them, so it belongs to the landowners. I know Tanzania well, I've worked there, so it's a bit different landscape. Uh, biodiversity also belongs to the people who produce the biodiversity, and they should be compensated for it. And that's the only way you can incentivize people to produce more biodiversity, more carbon. But to mammals, I, I don't have a clear view on that. They sort of move around, but whatever is wind or solar or biodiversity on the land, it belongs to the landowner. Yeah, it's, uh, it depends on the land tenure structure in every country. And worldwide, there are different land tenure structures from private landowners to communal area and government area. So there are ecosystem services that belongs to the landowner. So in a way to simplify the process and to incentivize, of course, the, um, the activities, it's those, the potential investments, revenues, or access to additional incomes through the enhancements of biodiversity belongs to the specific landowners in, in every specific country land tenure structure. Thank you. I believe we have another question there. Yeah, hello, I'm Geoffroy de Cagnier from Forest for Europe. We speak about how to value and quantify biodiversity. Each ecosystem is very different and meets different challenges. Do you think it makes sense and it would be even possible to try to standardize the value of the impact of the biodiversity? Um, I don't want to go too deep into the valuation because I think that is a very contentious um, conversation that we might not have time to have now. But I would like you. I would like to invite you to go and visit our stand and get the demo of our reporting platform because it's a really nice uh, example of, uh, well, a real life example of um, some of the companies we had that have biodiversity that are measuring biodiversity and reporting on biodiversity impact across different types of projects. So you know there they, there is a way where they have found metrics that would work, for example, on a mangrove a mangrove site, a mining site a forest restoration site. So I think that is the first step, again, to go back to metrics, is to find that level of comparable metrics um, that can then be like, and you can have obviously these additional more uh, project specific ones. And I think you need to have that first and then build the pricing on that. But there will always be an element of non-fungibility and an element of non-standardization. And I have, no, I have spoken to project developers who are actually using the approach of pricing based on the input costs, which is more pragmatic, but might not work in the market in the long term. Thank you. There is another question there. Yeah, hello, Fabian schmidt Pramo from Biometrio Earth. Um, I have a question to the panel. Um, if we look at the evolution of the voluntary carbon market, it uh, basically took 20 years to reach the scale we see nowadays. 
So what are your pins and tips for the biodiversity market to scale much more quicker because we really need to mobilize more funding for nature-based solutions? Uh, the first thing is just to believe we can uh, put uh, at least a proxy price to the intervention that can enhance biodiversity and not be afraid to say it. we can go beyond that, we can use it. Basket approaches, matrix approaches that allows you to pick the best indicators according to your project-specific scenario, it's useful. There are frameworks right now. You know, I've been for the past 10 years uh, looking to connect biodiversity into market mechanisms. The, the, the last two years, there have been a huge advances on that. Let's don't go backwards and say biodiversity is too complex and we cannot uh, uh, develop a proper market mechanism to drive investment into the landscapes. So carbon markets were very good driver of investment to enhance biodiversity to the same level of activities, restoration, conservation, you know, we have, uh, we have all these elements in common. There are pricing strategies developed so we can go beyond and can connect these, these, these biodiversity outcomes into market mechanism. I know very short. Actually, Very short. I'm not able to read her no. lips. So. <laughs> you have like 10 words or less. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Do develop a good showcase project with best practice. Do it. <laughs> nice. Very good. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> See you in the coffee.